and uh, welcome to uh, the uh, Georgia Society of Professional Engineers Atlanta Metro Chapter monthly meeting. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to make a couple of announcements. Uh, first, I'd like to encourage you, if you haven't already done so, to become a member of an SPE. After all, an SPE is uh, the premier uh, uh, organization that advocates for the interest of us engineers. Um, I'd like to also encourage you to follow us on LinkedIn, Facebook, Meetup, YouTube, all the uh, social media sites, and uh, also to please share with your colleagues. Uh, we're, we're asking for uh, volunteers for our premier competition, uh, or rather the NSPE's National Society of Professional Engineers premier competition. This is Math Counts. It is a nationwide uh, competition, math competition for middle school uh, students. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're looking for volunteers to help proctor the competition. This, uh, keep in mind this date, this year, first of all, it's going to be virtual, uh, of course, because of the pandemic. And uh, the state competition will take place on March 25th. Uh, for additional information, you can contact any of us uh, here at the board uh, or at the uh, state level, Georgia Society of Professional Engineers, or you can also visit mathcounts.org. Uh, another organization that we partner up with is GEF, Georgia Engineering Foundation. And what they do is they distribute uh, scholarships to uh, students who would like to pursue uh, studies in the engineering field. Although the applications deadline has already passed, they're in the process of reviewing, there is definitely still time for companies to sign up to become uh, sponsors. The deadline is January 21st. Uh, for additional information, please, uh, I'd like to direct you to GEF inc.org. And the final announce announcement that I have today, this evening, is uh, Engineers Week is coming up. It is going to take place between February 21st and 27th. And if you're looking for ways to get involved, uh, I'd like to direct you again to, to uh, anyone here on the board that you have access to or nspe.org. Very well. Our speaker this evening is Scott Sutter, uh, and he will be speaking on patents and other intellectual property explained. Uh, he is a registered patent attorney with uh, Wumble Bond Dickinson, and uh, I'll turn it over to Scott. Well, good evening, everybody. I appreciate you allowing me to speak and give you a, a general overview of intellectual property protection. Hey, Scott, if you don't mind, yeah. let me uh, go over a couple of ground rules with folks real quick, too. All right. Um, so everybody, if you have any questions, please go ahead and type them into the comment box. I'll be watching for those. Uh, and Scott has told us that it's uh, he's happy to do this interactive. So don't feel like you need to save them up till the end. Uh, at the end, uh, if there are additional questions, of course, we'll we'll hang out and do our best to answer those for you. And uh, beyond that, uh, if you guys want to chat amongst yourselves as well, feel free to do that. Just uh, keep it on topic if you would. Otherwise, Scott, it's all yours. All right. Well, thank you very much. And uh, again, thank you everyone for allowing me to speak today. Um, just to, by way of a quick background, uh, I've been a practicing patent attorney here in Atlanta for 31 plus years. And when I started out, it was with a, what used to be called the small boutique firms. So I had a lot of experience in dealing with patents, copyrights, trademarks, trade secrets, everything. Um, since I've now been with Womble, which is a larger firm, and over the time the, the practice has shifted a bit, my emphasis is more on patents um, and less on trademarks, copyrights, and other issues. Uh, I do prosecute primarily. My area of main specialty is mechanical, electromechanical devices. Uh, but I also have some experience, or actually pretty good level of experience in litigation as well. Uh, so that's kind of my general background coming at this. And just kind of as a start, again, this is just designed to provide an overview of intellectual property protections. And as Steve said, any questions are welcome. Uh, happy to answer anything. So let's go ahead and get started. All right, uh, just as kind of a basic overview, there's a number of types of IP fences and people use the term fences 
a lot of times because it, it's kind of an analogy or metaphor for a way of blocking other people out or protecting your intellectual property. And when I say your intellectual property and in, in a lot of these slides, I may refer to like a company or an organization, but it also applies to engineers individually. Uh, over the space of my career, I've worked with a number of engineers who have developed actually companies based on their intellectual property and have uh, been very successful at doing so. So it's kind of a general overview. What we'll start with is after the overview, talk about trademarks briefly, then copyrights, trade secrets. Then we'll get into patents, uh, both utility and design patents. And then lastly, will be contracts uh, that deal with intellectual property issues. Okay, so uh, just as a start, again, with an overview, a couple of types of patents. And these are the ones that the two that I've got listed up on the screen will be the ones that I think most of you will be concerned with. Uh, you've got utility patents and design patents. Now, there is also plant patents, which we'll talk about a little bit briefly later. But those are dealing with, as you can understand, plants. So it's actually you know, new tomatoes, new flowers, new species and genus of horticulture. So just as a kind of general overview, utility patent, those are the ones that will cover your process or your machines, your, your systems. And so they will be typically the broader scope of protection. Um, examples that we've got listed here will be like a mouse trap or telephone measurement devices, chemical compounds, um, for example, pharmaceutical. Um, we all know we've all experienced where uh, when you're you have a drug or a particular prescription that you want or need to have filled and the brand name is much more expensive than the generic. And a lot of times there may not be a generic, at least for a couple of years. And that is because of the patent protection that is provided to uh, utility patents covering those pharmaceutical compounds. And in a number of cases, for example, the reason that I say 20 years from data of filing a non-provisional, but have an asterisk in this last column is in some instances, you may get more or less than 20 years. Um, filing data, of course, is based on the earliest priority application. But in the case of, for example, pharmaceutical compounds or drugs, they actually get a patent term extension. And the reason for that is because you've got to go through the FDA and you have to clear all these drugs and they have to go through a lot of trials. So by that time, you could have exhausted most of the useful life. So they will give them extensions on, on that life. Um, Next would be design patents, which are ornamental or function or non-functional appearance of an item. You know, examples are, and we'll talk about this later, the Crocs shoes, the Coca-Cola bottle, or the Herman Miller chairs. Uh, those are more limited in terms of their life and really in terms of their scope of protection. You got copyright. Copyright to an extent and design patents can overlap. Uh, for example, sculptural works or uh, I've seen uh, copyrights filed on lamps and articles of manufacture. So there is kind of a, a bit of an overlap, but generally copyrights are, are looked at more in terms of like books, photographs, uh, software, things that people can copy or make a, a deriv what's called a derivative work or variation of it. Uh, copyrights are typically a bit simpler to file for and get protection on. Um, and their life is, depending on when it's published or, or when it's been created, could be up to 70 years plus the life of the author or 95 years from their first publication. Uh, trade secrets, those are you know formulas, methods, devices. There's also a whole list of, I guess, trade secret or categories of trade secrets under most state statutes that you know, cover the protection of your trade secrets. Um, of course, the, the main example everybody knows about is the Coca-Cola formula. Um, but you also have things such as survey methods or client lists. Also, you've got uh, another example listed here is the curve of high-end saw blades. So uh, there can be ways that you can protect things by trade secret, which are based on the fact that nobody else can figure it out. Okay. And lastly, we have trademarks. Uh, trademarks are indicators of a source of origin. 
and a Coca-Cola name. The Coca-Cola bottle is also a trademark or trade dress in this case. The Yeti name and logo. Um, the Disney characters or Warner Brothers characters often can form or are trademarks or, uh, okay. So next, uh, just as a, to kind of give you a visual example, and usually I like doing some, you know, visual example. And if we do this in person, it's easier to kind of show somebody physical samples of, of items. But the Apple iPhone provides a very good example of pretty much all the different types of intellectual property protections. Uh, you know, as you can see, you've got the, the trademark of Apple and the iPhone, uh, where it talks about the product containing its, its haptic engine and the logo on there. For example, as you can see to the kind of right side of the, the image, you've got the Apple with, of course, the bite taken out of it. That's a good example of a trademark. Then in terms of patents, of course, these patent or these phones have a number of intellectual property, or no, excuse me, a number of utility patents that cover a lot of the, the guts, if you will, of the phone itself, the battery or the power control software, um, the internal antenna, the gorilla glass, which is now the crack resistant, the camera. Uh, every time they update, they file numerous patents on the camera or the updates or the improvements to that. Uh, you also have, in this instance, the design patents. And not sure if a number of you, you may re recall a couple of years ago, Apple got into lawsuits with Samsung. And there was a lot of fights over the Android phones. And the, a lot of it came down to not just really the, intellectual, the utility patents, but more importantly, the design patents. And when I say more importantly, that's really where Apple won the bulk of their 400 plus million damages was based on Samsung's use of a similar user interface and the arrangement of icons and so forth. So those trade dress or designs became very important, especially as in terms of design patents and recovering damages for those. And lastly, you've got copyrights, which are the, you know, the software code or even the instruction manual that comes with the phone. And trade secrets, of course, you've got to understand with the way that Apple does things, there is a number of secrets built into the phone that are simply things that you're not going to be able to reverse engineer. Um, and for example, it took the, the federal government a lot of time and effort to try to get Apple to allow them to break the, the security on it. Um, you know, and one reason was Apple did not really want them getting access to the underlying code and some of the trade secrets built into their comes from Coca-Cola. It tells you what that is. You know exactly what the drink is. And it distinguishes that product from, say, Pepsi or RC Cola or something else along those lines. And it also has a lot of goodwill built up in that. So, for example, if you want, if you go to a restaurant, and I know down here in, in Atlanta, most of us will say a Coke regardless. But when you say a Coke or a Sprite or something along the that's what you want. And that's a good indicator of the quality and the type of product. So you readily acknowledge and you readily recognize the product by that brand name, or in this case with Coke, by the, the script and the, the design of the bottle. Um, one of the, some of the other examples we've got here are, you know, Kodak and the old Polaroid cameras. You also have things like Kleenex and Xerox. Uh, now, some of those you'll see where, if you recall, a couple of years ago, there have been advertising campaigns, for example, by Xerox. Xerox tried to or had a campaign where they said you cannot Xerox a Xerox on a Xerox. The reason for that was they had gotten so their brand had gotten so well named or known as far as Xerox that 
it was becoming generic. And once a brand becomes generic or brand name or trademark, you can lose your rights. So aspirin, um, things like that, which actually started out as trademarks, have now become so generic, Escalator, for example, that they no longer serve as a trademark or a valuable asset of the company that really started with them. Um, other things that you can have, for example, uh, I'm not sure how many of you actually have Christian Louboutin shoes, but the Christian Louboutin shoes are very high end, as you can see, thousand dollar plus women's shoes. There is they're well known for their red soles and there have been trademark cases or actual actions dealing with the recognition of the red sole on those shoes. And it has become very important because when you're selling shoes for a thousand plus dollars, you want to make sure that people, somebody else isn't knocking you off and selling for a hundred dollars or less. Okay. So that's where, you know, companies will do a lot to try to promote, first of all, the trademark and their brand recognition and then protect it very strenuously. Okay. An important feature of the trademarks or of trademarks is they can pretty much be indefinite. You can, Keep them going for as long as you are using them properly and as long as you're policing them and don't let them go generic and you have exclusive use. So I don't know, some of you may remember, some of you like myself who are a little older, may remember years ago when Coca-Cola started filing, they actually started selling like t-shirts and Coca-Cola clothing in stores. Then they had all kinds of other products with the Coca-Cola name on it. And one reason they started doing that was to broaden the name itself and broaden so that other people couldn't try to come in and chip away or erode or dilute the, the strength of their brand name. Because if somebody else came up and said, OK, I'm selling clothing and Coke doesn't sell clothing, but I'm putting this script on there. At some point, they could have lost those rights or lost the rights to the name. So they will sell clothing and sell other things to try to police that mark. But of course. Coca-Cola being an extreme example, most people are going to recognize that no matter what. Okay. And as a sub part of trademarks, you have what's called trade dress. Uh, for example, the McDonald's arches, those are a trade dress. Um, people, when they see the arches, they know that that is McDonald's. The Coca-Cola bottle, again, is a trade dress that has become so well known just by seeing the shape of the bottle. Uh, which originally could have been you know, may have been subject to a design patent, but now it's become so well known, it's a source identifier as well. So the trade dress can form the a trademark or a valuable asset to identify a source of products and services. So Scott, uh, we got a question here from Tom. Okay. And he's basically stating Kleenex, Brillo Pad uh, as examples. These are brand names commonly used in generic terms for decades. And the question is, are their trademarks negated or are just endangered? Those trademarks are generally endangered. Those are pretty much endangered. Uh, Kimberly Clark, which owns the Kleenex brand, that's why they came out and said Kleenex brand tissues. So if you'll remember a couple of years ago or several years ago, they started really pushing, you know, Kleenex brand tissues, meaning not saying Kleenex. And they didn't really want people to say, oh, you know, I'm using a Kleenex. They want them to say, I need a tissue. Give me a Kleenex tissue. Um, that's what most of that's why these companies will start doing that, because if you let again, if you let your your mark become so well known that people use it as a just a general description of, for example, aspirin or elevator, things like that. And Kleenex was one of those that was very much in danger of that. So they still fight that and they still try to make sure that they are using their mark in a way that they say Kleenex brand or to identify it as a brand of tissue, not just a generic. You want a tissue, you ask for, you know, it's a Kleenex. Okay. Um, hopefully that answered your question. Um, last couple of points on trade dress. Uh, if you'll see like the last bullet point, uh, color brown, UPS, the brown trucks, Owens Corning, the pink insulation, those have become trade dress or trademarks now, and they've been able to register those. 
Now, it's not that easy to do that with a color. A uh, color to typically has been something that the courts have shied away from and has been very difficult to claim as a particular trademark identifiable with one source of goods or one particular company. But that's where the long-term use and the acquiring of secondary meaning comes in. What secondary meaning generally refers to is the coat or the, for example, the color brown with UPS trucks or the pink for Owens Corning. When people see that, they automatically think of that company. So just because it's a general color or it's it's something that ordinarily may not be a very strong mark, it's somewhat descriptive, it has become so recognizable for a certain product with a certain company after their long use that then it can move to the area or move to the realm of being a protectable trademark. Uh, CNN, which is more of a brand and of course it's a, a word mark, when it first came out, because of the extensive advertising they did for Cable News Network and CNN, they were able to claim that it acquired secondary meaning fairly quickly and therefore get that as a trademark. Uh, ordinarily, if you have a generic or somewhat descriptive name like Cable News Network, that's not going to be very protectable as a trademark because they're trying to avoid taking up generic or terms that are, are generally available for the public and now saying, oh, well, this person owns that particular mark or this person owns this particular word. So that's where the secondary meaning comes in. If you can prove that in a certain good or class of goods or a certain group of services, your use of a somewhat generic term or a color, things like that have become so recognizable, uh, then it becomes your trademark. Um, you've got things like the, the MGM roar of the lion. That's become trademark because people recognize it as that's an MGM, the roar for the lion. It, and it identifies their movies. Okay. All right. We got a couple of actually one's a follow up from Tom. He says, thank you. I gather it's up to the trademark owner to clarify use of the term and not that public use alone endangers the trademark. Is that correct? That's correct. You have to, as a trademark owner, you do have to police your mark and avoid it becoming generic because when I say generic or avoid other folks using it. So for example, if you come in and you start, if you're not policing your mark and somebody else starts using it and this has happened, they have what are called concurrent uses. One example would be um, the uh, Einstein Brothers Bagels, okay? When they first came to Atlanta and they first opened up in, in Midtown Atlanta, they were called Melvin and Elmo's. Elsewhere, they had the Einstein Brothers Bagel. The reason they had to use Melvin and Elmo's was Einstein's restaurant, which was about half, half a mile away, had been using that name in Atlanta for much longer than Einstein Brothers Bagels have been using. So they could not get it in, the, in Atlanta until they cut some kind of deal. Okay. So it can wor work in the reverse as well, where you're using your mark, but you don't police it when somebody else starts using it. And as a result, you lose your rights. Okay. Uh, and this one may be a little too specific. I don't know. I'll let you decide. But uh, Jeff says, isn't the T-Mobile magenta color trademarked? Uh, honestly, I don't know whether that one is, is trademarked at this point. It may be, uh, you know, I know that they promote that and use that color, but I'm just not aware of the specifics as to whether that one is, has been registered as their particular trademark. Okay. And let's see, Bob says, uh, interesting. He says, you may want to leave out quote instruction manual unquote out of the iPhone example. There isn't one. Uh, none at all. If you go to look it up online, you'll find a four-page FCC and UL warnings, and that's all. Um, actually, I can tell you, Bob, I, I haven't looked in a little while, but there was always an uh, iBook uh, in the Apple bookstore that was essentially an owner's manual. So I don't know if you want to address that or not, Scott. Well, it's, it, yes, I think it's it, probably nowadays they just have kind of the iBook, you know, some of the original phones and original things that were produced and they do have just the general pamphlet that come with the phones now. So uh, the only reason for that example was 
when they have written materials or things that could be called a manual or something like that, that goes along with the phone, those type of written materials are also copyrightable. Okay. Yep. Yep. All right. And then let's see, John uh, says, yeah, Amazon was able to patent the quote, one click buy unquote. That was surprising. Mm -hmm. And he goes on to say, Amazon's patent is on the single click to buy apparently. Oh, that was Bob saying that. Sorry. Okay. Yes, that's correct. And I can address that later with the patent or just go ahead and address it now. Yes, Amazon did get a patent on that, on the one click shopping, the one click to buy. Uh, and interestingly enough, got it just before Christmas several years ago and filed for basically a preliminary injunction and shut down Barnes and Noble's site right before Christmas. So you can imagine how much issue and, and how much that cost Barnes and Noble. So, and that was a, a patent on software. Um, nowadays, it's a little bit more, you've got some more hurdles to jump, jump over uh, or not really hurdle or new hurdles, but ones that had been, I guess, strengthened with some case law. But we'll address that a little bit later when we talk about the patents. Okay. All right. Any other questions on trademarks? Mm, that's it for the moment. Okay. All right. So copyrights, and again, just being general here, uh, it's an original work of authorship fixed in a tangible medium exp of expression. Okay, we'll have some examples later, but in the next slide, but some of the benefits of copyright is it's cheap and relatively easy to apply. And by that, I mean, if you look on the right side of the, of the slide here, you'll see where it says copyright, see in a circle, 2018 by Bill E. Elliott. And this is an example. And the reason I can use this example is there is some, there is a fair use example or fair use exception for copyright, where even though you copy something, if it's used for educational purposes, such as what we're talking about here to discuss and give people a, an, a basic understanding of copyrights. Okay. Um, when I, I say it's, it's cheaper and easier, the copyright notice, like you see on the screen on the right side here, um, that's something that you do. When you create the work of authorship, like you write a manual or you come up with a new so a program or you come up with, for example, a, a design of a, you know, a website or just the pages of it or artwork, you apply that copyright notice and it's when you create it. You're the one that created it. You don't necessarily have to register it with the patent or with the copyright office. So unlike trademarks and, and patents, uh, principally patents, you don't necessarily have to re register the copyright. You need to when you, if you want to sue on it and claim damage, more damages for that. But it's something that by creating it and you put the C in the circle with the date and your name on it, you're you're telling the world. I created this and this is my copyright. OK. With pat or with trademarks, just to kind of jump, jump back there, you'll sometimes see like a T in a certain a TN next to the mark. That means somebody is reserving this as their trademark. And again, that like copyrights to an extent, that is the protection or your ability to claim rights in it starts when you create or when you first use that mark. Now, the federal registration, which is the R in the circle, once you obtain that, that gives you a priority of use of that mark nationwide. So for example, if you register it, even if you haven't gone into say a neighboring state or you haven't gone into, if you're in Georgia and you haven't used the mark in California, when you do, you still have priority of rights and priority of use over someone who may see your mark and decide they wanna use it in California. But if you've got a federal registration for it, you have that priority of, of right nationwide, okay? Jumping back to copy, copyrights here, the copyrights, they can vary by country and they'll vary by dates of publication. But typically, like the U.S. is 95 years from the publication date, earliest publication date or 70 years plus the life of the author. So it can get a little bit gray or a little bit confusing as to really when and how long that is. Um, one example might be that you could go back and you could create a, 
a compilation or you could create your own version of, for example, Beethoven's fifth. Okay. And because he's been dead for much more, much longer than 70 years, of course, you can do that because it it's becomes your new independent creation. For example, if you do a new score for it, but if you copy one that somebody did say 20 years ago, you may be infringing that person's copyright. Okay. Um, now in terms of the copyrights, they only protect kind of the look and feel. So a lot of example, one example people give is instead of protecting the function, like a, a utility patent would, a copyright essentially is or protects like if you take your design or the book or a painting and put it on a copy machine and run the run a copy out that way that's what it's protecting it's protecting people from copying exactly what you have created but there is a caveat to that too in that you have the right to protect derivative works so derivative work is something where you create for example, uh, a work of art or create a, a piece of software and then you improve on it later. You have the right to keep doing that as it's a derivative work. Somebody else comes in later and they take what you've done and they kind of modify it slightly. And but it's still basically the same kind of copy or can, same software or same piece of art. That could be an infringement because they have created a derivative work. Okay? So. Some examples, well, again, we have the literary works like The Great Gatsby, The New Yorker magazine, um, photographic works, uh, musical works, songs, scores, uh, works of visual art. Uh, you've got the paintings, you've got um, sculptures. So those are all examples. You also have software, of course, and that's probably more important for a number of you, a number of engineers. So again, what the copyright provides is the owner can make copies. They can make their derivative works. They can sell or distribute the copies or publicly deform, perform the work, or they can display it and they can block others from doing that once they have their, their copyright. And again, you don't necessarily have to register it to create the copyright, but registration generally is required. If you're going to sue somebody and claim, for example, statutory damages, Statutory damages are damages provided by the federal copyright law, which, for example, if somebody is uh, infringing it, they'll say, all right, you if you prove infringement for each copy, you can get statutory damages, which are a set amount of damages for each infringing copy. All right. So. Trade secrets. OK. Trade secrets are actually becoming more well known. And, you know, it used to be people would talk about just the formula or a secret sauce of the Coca-Cola formula, but it's becoming more and more important to kind of look at uh, whether you have a trade secret. You know, if you have a patent, it's important to file for protection on it. But if it's something that nobody could figure out, maybe you want to keep it as a trade secret. Uh, again, the point being that trade secrets are valuable because they're information not generally known. And it's something that people really can't figure out or reverse engineer. So for that reason, unlike a patent, they don't have a lifespan that is limited or tied to a filing date. They can have an indefinite lifespan. And the, the Coca-Cola formula again being a great example where it has been out there. I mean, they've been selling Coke for over a hundred years, but as long as they've kept that secret of the formula, that can still keep it protected. Okay. Hey, Scott, back on now, fair use real quick. Uh, Bob <laughs> says the fair use exception for educational use is on a per instance basis. Uh, he says uh, Georgia State University got sued for reusing news articles for course packets. Care to address yeah. that? Mm -hmm. Well, if they're using it as part of that, where they're kind of reusing the information and it no longer becomes just like an educational use, it could be argued that it is not a it's more of a commercial use at that point. So when you start reusing things, um, that's where you get in a little bit of trouble. You know, you want to make sure that it is not it really wouldn't be considered a, a commercial use, um, something like that. So because people are taking the copyright course and they're putting it in the book or they're they're using it as part of the course materials that are um, being either 
bought and paid for or something like that, then it, that's where you get into some problems. You know, now once that, you start into the commercial use side. Now, in that case, would it be in part because, I mean, the students are paying tuition? I mean, does it kind of come down to money? If you're paying for it, it's not fair use. But if it's not paid for, it is? Or is that not necessarily valid either? Well, that's that can factor into it, certainly. But if you're the more that you're using it kind of over and over and over and it's for a class or it's for a, you know, something that you are receiving compensation, then it becomes less likely that it is a just pure educational purpose. Okay. Yeah, and again, that that can depend, too, on the court that reviews it and how they view it. Yeah. Well, since we're on that topic, let me, I'll give you an example and see what your take on it is. Uh, so, you know, some of what you see behind me is my recording booth for doing voiceover work. And I've always been taught and it's pretty much um, understood in the industry for voiceovers that if you take, let's say, a snippet of a copyrighted advertisement on TV, let's say, uh, and you re re-record that in your own voice. You're not claiming to be the person who did the original and you're not making money on it, uh, but you're just using it for a demonstration of your capabilities. Uh, most people accept that that falls under fair use. I'm curious what your take is. Well, I think if you're, if you're pulling a, um, a snippet or sampling, if you will, from you know somebody's recording, I can pretty much almost tell you that ASCAP and BMI and, and those groups would say that that's not a fair use. Well, it's just the words. It's yeah. not their audio. So you're reproducing the audio. All right. So if you're just kind of, you're creating a new audio and it's just the words, you know, again, it, it becomes, is it identifiable with that certain group or is it, you know, how common are these words? How common is that, uh, that phrasing? Sure. Um, you know, it's, I have seen cases where, again, you know, ASCAP and BMI, they are extremely aggressive in going after kind of any kind of uses. And, you know, a lot of people are very protective of, you know, their prior works and their songs and so forth. And the sampling issues have been, you know, have been a lot, uh, have been, I guess, have come to the forefront on a lot of occasions. Uh, I think there was a, some, uh, a singer, or more recently, um, I can't remember, it's one of the, the female rappers who she just got sued and she ended up having to pay about $450,000 for sampling a, uh, a prior song of an older artist. And she just, you know, of course, was pulling parts out of it. And so she but she ended up having to pay. Yeah, I think she was actually sampling the original audio recording, too. But uh, let's see. Bob has a follow up. Um, he says, nope, the fair use regs are incredibly detailed and complex. I was told I could not use an overhead of a New York Times article from one semester to the next. Well, again, if you're reusing it um, a lot of times and again, it's going to depend on some of the courts the way they look at it to be safe. That's what most people will do is take the, the, the view that, all right, don't reuse that. If you're taking somebody else's copyrighted material, uh, you can use it as an example, but try not to use it over and over. Sure. And then Roger has a follow up to that. Uh, he says, I suspect the difference is quoting an article to illustrate a point versus using the quote to teach the subject. Yeah, again, it, it's it's really going to depend on your circumstances. Um you know, it's honestly, I've not kept up as much with the, you know, the litigation side of tra of copyrights. Um, but again, you know, if you're if you're quoting somebody and, and giving them proper credit, um, you know, it, it still could be considered. It just depends on if that that person or that group wants to create an issue. Yeah. And most companies or most, for example, a lot of universities will try to avoid any kind of issues at all. So if somebody has raised an issue, doesn't necessarily mean if they're they're correct, but if they raise the issue to avoid any any problems, um, it's it's a safer approach. All right. Okay. Well, that's what we got for the moment. I'll let you carry on. Okay. All right. Um, so some additional uh, considerations on trade secrets. You can call things a, a trade secret again. 
a lot of state laws have very particular, I guess, definitions of what falls under their trade secret law. Okay. But you need to take precautions. You can't just say something is secret. Um, you know, you have to have employee and third party agreements. You don't want somebody walking into your facility or just taking a look at things. And you know, if you're an engineer, you don't want to just show somebody something without having an agreement in place to keep it confidential. You need to take those steps. Uh, there have been a number of cases where companies lose that trade secret protection, even though they say, hey, we stamp things confidential. We did, you know, we tr tried to keep it confidential. They, this was our secret. But if they didn't take the full steps, for example, they allowed people to walk in and out of their facility or walk into their secure R&D area without any kind of checks or without people stopping them. You know, some companies were very, they wanted to show off their, their new R and D. Well, by doing that without any kind of procedures or ways of controlling that you could lose your secret. So you have to be very careful about how you police and make sure that if you're going to call it a trade secret, you are keeping it a trade secret. Okay. Uh, and again, some of the benefits of the trade secrets now they're, you're finding greater damages in terms of if somebody breaches or, or breaches confidentiality agreement. It's not as much possibly in terms of damages or an issue, but when you put in trade secrets or classify certain information as a trade secret and therefore subject to damages and the trade secret laws that can kind of increase your, your potential recoveries. Now options, of course you have, and you, you've had this for a long time, the state laws. Most states, and Georgia follows the Uniform Trade Secrets Act. Okay. So it's, it's very similar across the different states. But several years ago, you had the Defend Trade Secrets Act, which came in. It's a federal law. So it establishes a private cause of action under federal law for theft, for theft of trade secrets. Okay. Some of the benefits this gives you is again, increasing your damages, but also it allows you now to go to the federal courts and sue uh, where it's intended for interstate commerce. So it's not just having to go into a state court or deal with the state courts. You can get into the federal courts now, even if you're bringing in both the state and federal causes of action, which can give you some very significant advantages in terms of procedurally and um, pushing forward with your cause of action. Okay. All right. So let's go to patents now. All right. Now, patents, and again, a lot of this discussion may be related more to, you know, we're just going to deal with kind of the utilities and the designs. So starting with the basic discussion of a patent, it's a disclosure of an invention in exchange. So you're giving your invention, you're putting it out there in the public in exchange for a 20 year right. And again, that is based on a filing but 20 year right to exclude others from making, using, selling, offering to sell or importing. Okay. Now, when I say a 20 year right, it's not necessarily 20 years. Okay. It is a based upon the earliest priority date for your filing. So if you file a utility application and that's when your clock starts running now. So you set, say you file a utility application on uh, a new iPhone and you file it tomorrow. Well, your 20 years of protection is going to run starting from that date. Now, the problem is, of course, that you can't really enforce the patent until it issues. And you may end up, of course, with a lot less life than 20 years, depending on how long the prosecution takes. And you may get some additional life added onto it if the patent office takes too long to get it through. But again, your rights are based on the earliest priority date. So, for example, someone had, uh, I think, Steve, when we were talking a little bit earlier, the mention was about continuing applications or divisional. So they're, they're applications that are based on an earlier filed prior application. That in exchange, when you file those, yes, you can extend or you can get different coverage, but it's fi the filing date, since it's based on an earlier priority date, that's going to reach back all the way to that earliest date. So you may not for any later applications, you're not going to get 20 years from their filing date. You're going to get 20 years from the earliest filing date. 
Okay. Now designs, of course, are a little bit different. They get 15 years from their date of issue. Okay. Again, also, you'll notice I've highlighted where it says the right to exclude others. Okay. Patent doesn't necessarily give you the right to make and use your own invention. Okay. And as we talked about down below, there may be a dominating patent that's held by somebody else. You may have um, issues, for example, Asinor Estoppel. Okay. There's actually some case law right now in front of the federal or excuse me, the U.S. Supreme Court dealing with the doctrine of Asinor Estoppel. And that doctrine is something where it essentially says if you're an inventor and you assign your rights in a patent to some some company or someone else, you cannot then go back and challenge that right, or you can't challenge the validity of those patents. And by doing that, for example, if you give an exclusive license or exclusive rights, or you sell or assign your patent rights to a third party, you may not be able to make that invention again. So they may pay you some damages or, or excuse me, uh, royalties, or you may get a lump sum for that, that technology but you may not be able to ever use it again until that patent expires. Okay. Um, all right, just jumping back in a little bit, you know, a U.S. patent doesn't provide rights outside the U.S. Of course, it's only good inside the U.S. So you can block somebody from selling. That's where the importing comes in. You can block them from bringing in your invention and trying to sell in the U.S. But if they sell it outside, make and use and sell outside, you can't touch them unless you have a patent covering that invention outside the U.S. Another point here at the bottom is a provisional application is not going to be a patent necessarily. Okay. And there's a lot of you'll see on on TV or, or some of these commercials where they talk about a provisional patent or a provisional application. Provisional application is essentially a place saver. It's you can file the provisional application and it creates a priority date that you can then file a later utility based on that. Okay. So if you, for example, have an invention that you're working on, you think somebody else may be working in the same area, even if you haven't fully developed it, you can file a provisional. Then you can file additional ones. And as long as you convert that to a full utility application within one year, you'll get the benefit of the earlier provisional date. If you don't, it just goes away. It's thrown away and nobody ever reviews it. The Patent Office does not review and they don't prosecute provisional applications. The only time the provisional application really becomes an issue or a review is once the utility patent on which it is based is issued. Then somebody will go back and look to see if you have sufficient disclosure, et cetera. Okay. So let's start with examples of what's patentable. Okay. Now you see, for example, up here, there's a, this is a, a butt pad for a rifle, similar to the rifle that you'll see on the left side. Uh, the butt pad has both design patents on the shape, as well as the composition of the material underlying that the harder rubber shell. Okay. So it, it's based on the claims are directed to the elasticity and the amount of resiliency that is provided by the underlying material. Okay. Um, the firearm over here has a number of not just the design for the, the butt pad, but then you've also got patents that utility patents that relate to the, the mechanism for adjusting the stock or where this stock actually folds over and this opening covers the bolt. Um, others, for example, here's a, a conveyor system which has patents on it. The fridge pack, which I know most of you have seen, and if you ever get, uh, for example, you, you buy a Coke fridge pack or a fridge pack from Pepsi, uh, you'll notice that there are slight differences between the two. And a lot of it comes down to the design of this opening and how these function. And some of them will have what they call a basket to catch the Cokes. There are probably 40 or more patents on this fridge pack. And it was the subject of some pretty extensive litigation years and years ago. The fridge pack was actually invented by a, a company based here in Atlanta called Graphic Packaging. Okay. It's been very important to them. And of course, they're filing still patents on different variations of cartons. Um, 
Other examples, here's the plant that I was talking about, plant patents. You got software patents and patents dealing with, for example, the, uh, the about.com website, uh, formulations. Uh, here's one that you may have seen, a number of you may have seen on, if you're driving by on a highway for road construction, this is what's called the silt saver. And it is a patent that was invented by a gentleman who is in Conyers, Georgia, had a road grading business and came up with this design to filter uh, materials and prevent them from drop or falling into the storm sewers prior to completion of construction of a road system. Okay? So they've got patents on the design of their basically the structure of the underlying plastic material, but also on this filter material and the way it's secured. Okay? So just kind of going into the utility patent basics, um, you're going to have an abstract, which is a, a brief description of the invention. You'll have a list of cited patents or cited references. Um, now these are, this can be important because a lot of times if you're a patent attorney and you see a patent that issues, especially with broad claims, and it has very few references, a lot of times you, you kind of look at that and say, well, is it going to be very valid or how easy will it be to invalidate that? And usually if there's not a lot of art cited, that typically makes it easier to invalidate. Okay? Uh, you're going to have drawings to illustrate the invention. Then you have a specification followed by the claims. The claims are the numbered paragraphs at the end of the specification. And it's a little bit in terms of the specification is extremely detailed and it will, it has to teach a person of ordinary skill in the art how to make and use the invention and how they're going to interpret the claims. The claims by contrast are going to be usually pretty broad and they'll use terms that are not terms that you're going to use in ordinary life. Um, you know, things like you know, say consisting thereof or comprising um, those materials. For example, you've got on the right side here, an example of an independent claim, which is claim one. So that will be the broadest claim of the patent. And you have a series of dependent claims that are based off of and essentially incorporate by reference all of the limitations of claim one into those dependent claims and they add further limitations. Okay? So what you're doing with the claims is you say, all right, here's the basic structure of or boundaries of what I can claim my protection to my invention. And then I have additional dependent claims, which is, a, which is a, in a sense, a shorthand way of repeating the independent claim, but adding additional limitations. And that's done, for example, if someone invalidates claim one, they still have to go to claim two, which may be valid and also may cover an infringer. They have to go to claim two, likewise claim three, et cetera. Okay. So jumping to, to design patents real quick. And the example here is those Croc shoes, okay? Crocs had, they actually filed a series of design patents, but also had some utility patents on this shoe. These are these EVA molded, you know, plastic shoes, basically. Uh, they were sold everywhere. And if you remember several years ago, they had them in every conceivable store. You had them in Walmart. You had them, you could find them in some of these uh, gas stations, for example. Um, then there was a, a a court case that went to the federal circuit. It was an ITC action, meaning international trade commission, which came in and found that the trade, the, the ruling of that said, well, the design patents are going, going to cover the impression. So they looked at it in that case and started and created a precedent where the design is going to be based on somewhat of a trademark type infringement uh, test. So it's going to be an impression, ordinary impression basically of, would this, would an ordinary observer looking at this shoe or looking at this thing believe that it came from Crocs, for example? So if you have like the Walmart brand and you put it up next to the Crocs brand, would you look at it and say, okay, they're the same or they came from the same group? So after that case and after Crocs prevailed, that's where you started seeing all these knockoffs vanish. They dropped out of all these stores except ones that were selling the Crocs brand. Crocs actually had their own stores for a while. So that's where the design patents became very important. And again, jumping back to the Apple uh, iPhone, that really was where the main damages that Apple was able to recover from Samsung for the infringement, you know, upwards of $400 million from that case. Okay. 
Again, just some basic features. Design patents are not tied to the date of priority, but rather they're 15 years from their date of issue. There's no maintenance fees, unlike utility cases, and application processing time is a lot quicker. So you can, some utility cases may take up to three years to get a first action, especially in the software arts. Uh, mechanical cases, it may be 34 months, I think is the is what they're shooting for is time of filing to, to end a prosecution. But for a design patent, a lot of times you can get them issued or allowed at least within less than a year. And a lot of times when you'll see those advertisements for patents or something is patented on TV, a lot of times it has to, it's a design patent. It's not necessarily a utility. Okay. But just briefly discussing the invention's path. Okay. An invention is considered conception plus diligence and reduction to practice. Right. What that means is you could have an idea, you could conceive of, for example, a rocket ship going to the moon, but that doesn't mean you've got an invention. Okay? It doesn't become an invention until you actually reduce it to practice. And now you can put it down in words in terms of a patent application, then it's called a consider, considered a constructive reduction to practice. Most times people will actually physically create or get something working as far as a, a physical reduction to practice of the invention. Okay. So some key points, an inventor develops the invention. All right. And the inventor is someone who conceives and they're not necessarily an engineer. And don't mean to say this in a derogatory fashion, but you can hire an engineer to say, create a prototype for you, but you're telling him what you want or you can have them kind of work through some kinks or some problems. For example, if you have created, uh, I guess, a, a piece of software, or you create a, a device and you need someone to create addition or come up with materials or, or actually put it into practice for you, but you're telling them exactly what to do, that engineer may not be an inventor. In most cases, they probably wouldn't be. Now, if they contribute though and they improve and that that improvement becomes part of the claims of the application, then they would be an inventor. Now, it's very important to get your inventorship right. The U.S., unlike some other countries which focus more on a company can be an applicant, the U.S. requires that you name the proper inventorship. If you don't, then they can hold your patent unenforceable. So there have been cases as well where an old case, Suzuki or Richardson versus Suzuki, where gentlemen came up with the design for and the conception of the forks for shock absorbing forks for Suzuki motorcycles years ago. And they actually put that design into practice. But because he was not employed by that company, they just filed under somebody else's name. He filed suit and was able to prove he was the actual inventor. So the company or the the courts forced Suzuki to assign him the rights to those patents. And of course, then he was able to hold them up and say, all right, if you want to use this, which is on all your bikes, you have to now pay me. Okay. So once you get your inventorship right, uh, basic procedure is you, you can search and then prepare and file the application. Again, remember your dates are important because the U S is a first to file system like the rest of the world now. So, Whoever files first is generally going to be considered the winner in terms of getting the, the application and getting the patent ultimately. Once you file, it goes through prosecution, which is the argument or discussion back and forth with the examiner. And hopefully you'll get the patent granted after that. Okay. Now, this is just an example of an invention disclosure form. A lot of companies will use something like this or, and you know, it's a good way to kind of create, um, or develop a record of your invention, all right? The form on the right-hand side is just the first page. It's usually a, a much more detailed, it's got say four or five different pages to it, which will have a lot of questions for inventors to answer. Um, you know, it serves as a good starting point. It's a way of creating and, and documenting your invention. Um, and, you know, again, kind of going back to the claims and, and the discussions maybe from earlier, um, Quite frankly, lawyers and engineers or lawyers and inventors, we're not always going to speak the same language. And the lawyer's job is to 
present the patent and present the claims in a way that is broad enough to cover if somebody tries to to change your invention or if they try to come up with a slight variation. Okay? Uh, you're not trying to copy or prepare a claim that reads directly on your invention. You want to cover any variations because infringers are not going to just change or they're not going to say, hey, I'm just going to copy this invention directly. They are going to try to modify or get around it. So that's why the claims will be drafted in a much broader fashion, but it doesn't always translate to the inventors or engineers. So uh, that's where questions come in. So you, if you're working with your counsel, you want to make sure that you ask questions. And first of all, they start out by listening to you, that they're not just telling you what your invention is. You know what your invention is. You have the best understanding of it much better than they do. You know, they can have a lot of experience in this art, but you still are the one since you came up with this invention, you know, the ins and outs of it. So they should listen to you first, ask questions, and then you need to ask questions of them as well, because it doesn't do you much good to file a patent application. And it's very limited to say a specific embodiment. And there's nothing else in there that co to cover it or cover expansion. And then someone else comes down the road and looks at it and says, Oh, well, I don't need to use this or I can do this differently and they get around your patent. Okay. And in terms of filling out these disclosures, you can't be too detailed. And by that, I mean, the more detail you can put into your application, the better off you are. Uh, uh, going back to the earlier example, when it goes into prosecution, you're going to have to fight with the examiner and fight is a lot of times the right term to try to get around what they call prior art or other references. And there may be times when you can't get, you know, the broadest of coverage. But if you have information in your application, if you have things to fall back on, maybe you can get coverage to the best way of doing it so that somebody has to still infringe. An example I can give is, is just real quick is one of the very first cases I was ever involved in when I first started practicing involved a series of locking panels that were designed specifically to be used over for repainting and refurbishing roof trusses in a paper mill. And if you've ever been a paper mill, the paper machines run 24 seven and they don't stop at all and you can't get anything in them. And so what they have to do is they have to actually work over the mill. So they had to install a flooring and actually work over the machine, which of course is, has bubbling sulfuric acid and other chemicals that are coming up and it's extremely hot. Uh, I can tell you from personal experience, it can be upwards of 120 degrees in those areas. So the invention was developed with a aluminum panels that had tongue and groove, groove extrusion. Of course, there was a lot of art out there, but the claims were limited to positioning a locking pin between the extrusions. And during the infringement case, the other side, tried everything they could to get rid of the pins. They even tried welding up the holes, but the people in the field knew that those pins, the, those panels were locked together once they saw the pins in there. So they would physically go in and drill holes and put the pins in creating an infringement. So even though the claim was a bit limited, it still was the best way to do it. And it still was an infringement. Okay. So just, I mentioned earlier that there's some statutory hurdles to overcome during examination. Uh, first of all, you have subject matter and utility. Subject matter now is kind of everybody talks about the Alice case. Alice was a, a lawsuit several years ago, and it involved what is generally known in the industry as a patent troll who had gotten a, an older patent that was extremely broad. And they tried to assert that patent against it was a, essentially a computer program or business method. And they tried to assert it against everybody in the industry who had any kind of financial or like selling insurance online, things like that. So the, the courts came in and said, no, you have to have something more that was directed to what's called an abstract idea or concept. So to get over those hurdles, you have to show and the patent office has now developed some very good guidelines and some specific ways to you know, hurdles that you have to get over or guideposts to get you past these to develop uh, 
your claim so that they meet the sub statutory subject matter and utility aspects. So once you get past those, then you have the description. Uh, 35 USC 112 deals with creating a, or providing an enabling disclosure so that pe persons of skill in the art would know how to make and use the invention that's being disclosed and claimed. Okay? You have to also provide it in clear and concise terms so that it's not vague. Uh, there is no more requirement of a best mode, but you still have to provide a, a good enabling disclosure. So then once you get past those, you have novelty. Novelty is essentially anticipation. And what that means is if somebody else has done what you're claiming so that you can take your claim and you can read it on that piece of prior art, your patent is not novel. Your claim is not novel. So it's not going to pass through that hurdle. Okay. But if you're able to, if your claim has, for example, multiple elements that are not found in any single reference, then it would be considered novel. So then you go to the last kind of hurdle, which is obviousness or non-obviousness, as it says here. And in that, that's where there is a lot of times the, the trip up or where people say, oh, well, you know, that's obvious to me. Well, obviousness, you can't look at it from the standpoint of how you of today. You have to go back in time to when the invention was first developed and when the patent was filed or application was filed. And you look at it from the lens of a person of ordinary skill in the art, understanding the prior art and not from the standpoint of somebody who may be an expert in the art as an engineer or someone who's done a lot of it. You may be extremely skilled or more so than the person of ordinary skill. So because you think something is obvious and especially if you're looking at it now, it doesn't mean that it's necessarily going to be obvious from a patent standpoint. Okay? Um, I think in the in the brochure Roger sent out or the, the sheet regarding this presentation, I mentioned that I've got a very good friend of mine and a long longstanding client who we filed a number of patents for them. And he likes to say the solution once found is obvious. And some of their biggest competitors have over the years continually said, hey, you know, we could have done that or we did that or. Yeah, that's obvious, but they haven't been able to prove it sufficient to invalidate their patents or knock them off. In fact, we've been able to, we've had two lawsuits for that company and both times have won, prevailed and upheld their patents. So, yeah. All right, some key takeaways. Again, you want to file as soon as possible after invention. The first to file is going to win. So if you start putting your invention out or show it in the public, you can run into an issue of somebody else using it or somebody else trying to beat you to the patent office or somebody else can claim or show that they did it independently. And if they put it out in the public based on the current law, as long as it's a day before or before you filed, they can win or they can invalidate your patent. Okay. Um, you got to be careful of offers for sale. Now, the U.S., unlike a lot of countries, has a one year grace period. So if you have your invention, it, the U.S. does allow you to put it out in the public and try to make an, a business case or see if your invention is going to be successful before you have to file on that application. Okay. Um, that's one reason to use provisional applications to save a date or place in line. Provisionals don't have to be as detailed as the utilities. You can file them with photographs or hand sketches, and you don't necessarily have to have full cl claims with those. Okay. Um, again, also, you want to preserve your rights in both U.S. and foreign markets. Most foreign countries, as it says here, are absolute novelty countries. And what that means is if you put your invention out in the public without some kind of confidentiality, for example, you go to a trade show and you show your invention, you're going to lose your rights to file, for example, in Europe. Now, if you go to a customer or a potential customer, customer and you're talking to them under a confidentiality agreement that's documented, you may not lose that right. Okay. But you have to be careful because again, businesses now are going to be looking not just in the U S or not just locally, they're international. Okay. All right. So just kind of in general, you know, quality patents, and this is the balancing act that you're going to do. Um, companies like IBM, they'll file on everything. IBM files, 3,000, 3,500 applications a year. For the most part, they don't care exactly what they're getting. 
because they're filing so many applications that they're going to get something that is a benefit and they're going to have so many of them that they can build like a pickets of a fence. Okay? You as an individual or as a smaller company may not have that luxury of filing as so many applications. So you want to balance your, your time and money and, but you also want to make sure you're getting a quality patent. So you may not file as many, but you may be more directed or may, may put more into what you're filing than in terms of a disclosure and research and everything that you're trying to claim in order to get a quality patent that's going to survive litigation and scare other people off. Okay. So uh, just quickly, you know, you've got different business strategies. That's what I was just talking about. For example, with, you know, if you're looking at something for lower costs or, you know, you just want to get the protections, maybe have that quote patent pending on it. Maybe you look at design patents, maybe use the provisional filings to kind of build up or save your date and see if you have a business case to file, uh, you know, a full utility application. If it's something critical to your business, you may want to fire, you know, proceed forward with the utility. You also may want to do more comprehensive searching or file multiple applications. You also need to consider the foreign files. Okay. All right. So what's the, given that the protection of IP is not a simple or easy process and that it can be expensive, what's the point? Okay. Uh, got a couple quotes here for, or a quote here, for example, from Warren Buffett. And he's talking about managing intangible assets than managing tangible. Intangible assets are your IP. Okay? It's your patents, your trademarks, your copyrights. And tangible assets may be your plant, your equipment. Those are depreciable. Now, some examples would be, and of course, most people think of, hey, I've got a patent. I'm going to sue somebody. So you're directly going out, you're blocking your competitors or you're trying to keep them out of the market. Doesn't necessarily mean you have to sue them. Um, you may have a sufficient or a robust portfolio where it keeps them out of the, the market because they're, they don't want to take the chance of getting sued. Okay? A lot of times patents will enhance the technological you know, image of your country, company or your, for example, if you're a, a consulting engineer and you have a number of patents, that can enhance your reputation. Okay. Like, so, yes. Oh, sorry, we got a couple coming in now. Um, let's see. Terry asks, how long is a provisional application valid for protection of the IP? Well, a provisional application has a, a one year lifespan, if you will. If you don't convert that to a utility application within one year, it's dead. It's basically thrown in the trash. Okay. Okay. And then Bob asks, and I don't know if you'll know the answer to this one or not, but what is the ratio of patent filings versus public disclosures at IBM? Uh, I really don't know. I do know IBM at one point set up a site specifically to provide public disclosures so that if they weren't going to file on it, then they could publish those to create a public record. Um, one of the former attorneys I used to work with was, was an IBM attorney for about 15 years. And he said that they would do that. Now they filed, like he said, about 3,500 applications a year, 3,000, um, and tried to get a, they always wanted to be at the very top of the list, but they also had that site. I think Bob, that you're you maybe referencing that was a, a way to publish an application or publish a disclosure that they didn't think was valuable enough to file on, but they also didn't want to just let it go. They want to prevent somebody else from coming on later and maybe making a slight improvement or something to that and then getting a patent. So they were just trying to block them out. Yeah, we did the same thing when I was at Motorola. We had a magazine that we actually published that was in the Library of Congress, uh, and we did it quarterly for that exact reason. It was just to block other people from getting patents on it. So. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Roger says, how about using design patents to protect spare parts market? Well, it, it depends on a design patent, of course, cannot be directed to the functional aspect of a part. So it's got to be directed to the ornamental appearance. Um, one example of a design patent, of course, like the Crocs, but you also have Nike, Reebok, Adidas file a quite a number of patents every year that are design patents and they're directed to the sole of the shoe, the upper, the tongue, the different parts of the shoe, the way it looks. Okay. 
So if you have a part, there has been some discussion about filing design patents on parts, especially with the 3D printing and so forth. But if it's covering, you know, if the part is really functional based and that's what dictates its design, you really can't get a design patent on that functional aspect. Now, if there's a, a way that you can make a part and it still comes up with the function or still provides the function, but it has an ornamental appearance or a different appearance, then yes, you could file design patents on that. Um, so kind of jumping back to where I was, uh, you know, if you look at enhancing technological appearance of the company um, and licensing revenue, they, they go a little bit hand in hand. Uh, IBM, of course, years ago, more or less stopped making actual products um, and they became more of a licensing company. So that's one reason they were filing so many patents. And that's really the bulk of their revenue is they make billions of dollars a year off licensing their IP. You know, Apple, which was the first company to hit one trillion, Google, Samsung, all these companies, even Amazon. I mean, Amazon is, you know, most people think of it just as a web service platform where you buy things, but they have got so much more. They have other businesses. They have the web hosting services. They have a lot of different things and they are filing constantly. And a lot of their, their information or a lot of their um, IP is what's been enhancing their, but their technological image as a, a leader, but also they generate revenue off it and they can block others. Again, going back to the Barnes and Noble and the one click shopping. Um, so, All right. Let's see. Roger has a follow up, I guess you could say. Uh, he says, I understand many automotive parts have design patents. I, I think that's different than a utility patent in that application, though, right? Yes. Uh, you know, some of them, if it's not so again, if it's not dependent on the function of the of the patented product, if that's not what's dictating the, the design, then yes, you can get a design on, for example, the rim for a wheel. You can get design patents on those. They're not necessarily based on the function. It's more the ornamental appearance. So that's that's really the difference between the utility and the design is the design is focused on the appearance and it is not covering the function. The functional aspects, the structure, things like that, that's the utility patent. Um, continuing down, for example, the negotiation. Um, a lot of people don't think about this one, but use of a portfolio is a bargaining chip. There's a number of companies that, uh, uh, for example, uh, I don't know if most of you know, but Georgia, of course, is known as the poultry capital, Gainesville specifically. And every year they have a, a large show. It's a poultry and egg show. And it's one of the largest shows for that type in the in the world. And of course, they draw people from all over the country and all over the world. And you have companies that make the machines that not only help you grow or uh, help cultivate the poultry, but also how you cut it up. And, you know, I, we've represented clients in that space in the last, you know, for years. And typically uh, we would have situations where we would get a letter or our client would get a letter after the show from a competitor who may say, Hey, we saw that you have this new device, this new cut up line or this new defeathering system. Here's what we have. We have a patent on this. We have, you know, so what are you going to do about it essentially? And you know, the response generally was kind of similar or almost the same every time, which would be, thank you very much for your letter. We'll, pull the patent and its file history. We'll take a review and we'll get back to you. And in the meantime, we noticed you had these, this piece of equipment that we have a patent on. And a lot of times that ended the discussion right there. It was somewhat of a form of de detente where every side had patents and there was really no, no interest in kind of fighting back and forth because, you know, if you sued somebody, they were going to sue you right back. So it was a good way to kind of keep people at bay and a way of negotiation. Or you could get into situations where you had a patent or you got sued and maybe you wanted to, they wanted something you had and you wanted a license under the patent you got sued on. So you could work out a cross licensing deal and avoid the litigation issues. Okay. 
uh, defensive uses. This is where you may you may have future inventions or, or things that don't necessarily get into, say, your particular your product line or your particular company's direction, but it's a good invention and maybe your competitors are using it or maybe it's something you may go to, into in the future. So you want to have some protections so that you have those assets for the future. And lastly, the collateral. Okay? This kind of gets back into Warren Buffett's quote in terms of the intangible assets and making money. Here is patents and IP, whether it's the trademarks, the copyrights, those can be extremely valuable to, for example, banks in terms of collateral. There's a lot of companies that will have a line of credit for hundreds of millions of dollars and it's secured not necessarily by your, your depreciable equipment, but by your IP. And, you know, going into bankruptcy, that is a lot of the, the value that is left in a company is their intellectual property. So it can provide a significant value there, much more so than if you were going to try to license or, or maybe suing on it. Um, so as you go forward, you kind of want to evaluate and evolve your bit, your business or your IP strategy with your business. And, and it's, it's fairly straightforward. You want to make sure that what you're filing for again is you're doing that balancing. You don't want to just keep filing on everything necessarily. And unless that's part of a business strategy to cover a certain product line or, if it's your key product line. So you may want to evaluate and audit or analyze your, your portfolio, whether it's key patents or trademarks, uh, copyrights, other things. What, what do you have? For example, utility patents, as mentioned earlier, you're going to have to file maintenance fees or pay maintenance fees during their life. If you file foreign, those fees are every year. In the U.S., it's three and a half, seven and a half, eleven and a half and a half years, and they can be fairly expensive. So, you may want to weigh that value of continuing those patents. And you know, if it's just not something in your, your business model or in your business line anymore, anymore, maybe you look at selling them off or maybe you just kind of drop it and keep that, spend that cost or spend that money elsewhere. Okay. But again, you know, keep in mind the defensive uses and do you have something your competitors might want? Yeah. Or is it a way of, you know, giving you an asset for negotiation or again, collateral? Okay. So let's see. And then the last sets or last set of slides here that I want to go through is really the agreements and protection of intellectual property rights through agreements. Okay. Now, excuse me, these can be you know, somewhat of a trap if you if you're not aware of it, um, you know, starting with non-disclosure agreements or confidentiality agreements. Now, these are agreements, uh, you know, they're fairly standard. You have some more or less almost kind of boilerplate agreements, but you also have to be aware of a couple of things. First of all, if you have an invention, you want to make sure that you're not, you want to make sure you have an NDA or some kind of confidentiality relationship or agreement in place before you show your invention or your new development to anybody else. You know, again, it's you can prove if you can prove they derived it from you, then you can try to claim, you know, inventive rights in that, even if somebody else files the application. But it is not always that easy. And a lot of times, you know, if a company puts it out in the public or it gets out somehow, then you've got to try to enforce the NDA and prove that that disclosure was made by you and that other company somehow put it in the public. Okay. So again, first to file rules emphasize the re, you know the need for these agreements and the need for provisionals. Okay. You know you've got a couple different types. One way or unilateral. That's going to be something. For example, if you're an individual consultant or engineer or even a smaller company, and you go to somebody like Google or Nike, they're going to push for their agreement, and it's going to be very much slanted in their favor. So you need to be aware of that and be very careful when you start to review and. Don't just sign these right out, out of hand. Okay. Two-way or mutual NDA, those are generally the norm. You know, at least that way the obligations are mutual on both sides. But again, you, you kind of have to be aware because even companies that will propose those, some of the obligations are going to be slanted in their favor. Okay. Um, other agreements, you've got assignments of rights. And I touched on this a little earlier where you can have an exclusive assignment or a non-exclusive and it can be a, you know, 
a license as well. Uh, if you give up your rights, for example, you assign your rights either by an exclusive license or you just assign it outright, you as the inventor don't have the right to use that invention or uh, try to block somebody else or even give rights to someone else later on. Right? Um, one example would be years and years, ago, of course, this is going back to the early 1900s, but the gentleman that developed the, the revolver, the double action revolver for Smith and Wesson had filed a number of patents and he sold those to Smith and Wesson and they were going to pay him a, a license fee or they're going to pay him rights based on their sales. But they also had built into that agreement agreement or a provision that he would have to indemnify them against infringement claims. So he essentially went broke because he had to defend Smith and Wesson against a number of infringement claims by other manufacturers, but he also couldn't make his own invention. So he was stuck with trying to develop or use an invention and make sales of you know, parts that were not nearly as, as effective and people just didn't want them. So the poor guy went broke, basically defending an invention that he had sold and that was you know, made a ton of money for Smith and Wesson and made that company, started them on the road to where they are. Okay? Now, other issues, trade secrets. Again, you want to address those specifically and separately in your agreements. You don't want to kind of tie those up with general confidential information. Okay? Um, joint development and manufacturing agreements. Some pitfalls there is you want to make sure you spell out the IP ownership. And a problem is if you have joint ownership of the IP, that means they, the other party can do whatever they want. They can license somebody and they don't have to give you a share of it, nor do they have to consult you. So you may have a, a competitor that you don't want to have a license to your invention, but because of a joint development you did with somebody else, they get a license. Okay. Uh, you also have contractor work made for hire agreements. That's going to be more important for, say, you know, consulting engineers or people who in your, your business that may be working with other companies, um, being careful of what those agreements provide and what they say in terms of how you have to assign your rights or any developments that you come up with. Okay. Um, again, addressing trade secrets separately. Now, there's no such thing as a form agreement. Um, you know, it's like I said earlier, you do have some of the NDAs that are, they're kind of have some boilerplate language in it or standardized language. But again, you need to be careful when you go through those of what exactly is in the, the language, because it's never going to be, you know, exactly what you may want. And it has to be tailored really to the deal. What are you trying to get out of this? Um, you know, you've got defensive claims and indemnity issues, for example. And, and I highlighted that again, because you've got situations where maybe you're assigning your patent rights or, or whatever your developments are to a third party. Okay. You don't want to be stuck on the hint on the hook for having to defend against any claims of in, patent infringement by somebody else. If they're going to own the patent rights or if they're going to own your rights that you're assigning with them, you don't need to be on the hook for the indemnity. Now, on the other side, they're going to say, well, if you're not assigning us anything or you're not giving us or you're giving us as a license, then maybe you would have to be on the hook for their indemnity. Okay. So you want to be careful and define your the patents and technology being covered. You don't want just a broad, hey, anything you come up with in this field is going to be ours, or as long as the agreement is, is going on, it's going to be ours. Okay. So again, being specific up front, and honestly, there are a lot of times when you have people that, you know, and this used to be more the norm where companies would say, well, you know, we do be business on a handshake deal. Well, it may be that it's your best friend that you're creating an agreement with. But that doesn't mean that in the future, you're not going to have an issue over what that agreement covers and what you're going to have to give them or what you thought you were going to give them. So trying to get all these issues addressed up front and really reading through and understanding what you're agreeing to is ultimately the most important thing. Okay. All right. So, you know, future developments, uh, future developments or related technologies, um, you know, Who's going to be owning those? Again, can a licensee or license or use? Do you have a license back, for example? 
if you create an invention and sign it to somebody, do they give you a license back so you can at least, you know, make and sell the invention in, say, in, in a specific market? Um, do they have a right of first refusal? And that can be important. You know, a lot of universities sometimes have that with their professors where if they decide the university doesn't decide they want to patent it or pursue it from an economic standpoint, then the, the professor may have the right to then take it and do it on his own. Okay? Um, you know, disclosure, joint ownership, again, uh, some of those issues. Okay? By the way, Scott, I heard because uh, I grew up in Florida and, and uh, University of Florida was kind of a rival I uh, understand that the folks that created what we now know of as Gatorade uh, mm -hmm. fell into that first right of refusal situation and the University of Florida passed up on it. Yes, uh, I seem to remember that happening. And, and of course, then, you know, of course, the, the name and of course, they lost all rights to it, which is why Gatorade is a pretty good sized company now. And, you know, University of Florida. You know, they've gotten some press out of it, but I don't think they get a lot of money out of it. So uh, some last points on the agreements. Um, ensure that the if you're going to use an assignment and, for example, if you're with a company, you got to use present tense wording. And what I mean by that is you don't want to say, well, so and so agrees to, you know, you agree to assign inventions that you may come up with in the future. Right. Okay? You want to say something more along the lines of you assign all rights to your inventions. You, you want to make sure that it's present tense. The reason for that is there was some case law a few years ago where Stanford had sent a one of their professors who was doing research on some of the initial tests for the AIDS virus. And he went, they actually arranged for them, for this professor to go to an outside company and work with them because they were developing something. So he went in and the first thing that they made him sign when he walked in as part of their uh, procedures and their, you know, ensuring that confidentiality was, he signed an agreement that he walked in. Well, part of the language in that agreement, and of course he didn't give it to counsel or, you know, the university to, to look at, but he signed an agreement that said, you agree to, you assign all inventions hereby to this company. Not you agree to assign, but you assign it here, hereby assign. Well, Stanford filed patents on the, the test kits and related aspects of it. And it was based on the work this guy had done with this other company. So then that company, their intellectual property or their, that company was bought later on by Novartis. And Stanford ultimately sued Novartis for infringing the patents and it came down to that simple phrase of agree to assign versus you assign and the supreme court said no because of that improper wording of your employee agreement with this professor that was covering future developments what he signed was the current inventions so this company and therefore novartis now owns a share of the patents so instead of getting billions of dollars in damages, they walked away with nothing and the other company got a share of the patents. Okay. So you need to be careful about the language again. All right. Uh, you've got misuse. That's a little bit probably you know, too detailed for this discussion, but you know, open source, for example, different licenses, licenses under open source software carry different rights or in requirements. So you can patent some inventions that include open source software, but you have to be understanding it and careful about what you're using, what is part of an invention versus what is actually part of the open source software. Okay. Uh, you also may want to consider privacy issues that are coming up. Okay. Um, and then lastly is you know, just a general, what to do if you're accused of infringing. I mean, basic first step is talk to a lawyer, but you also need to keep your documents and information related to the dispute. Electronic discovery is the norm now. So you will get, if you talk to an attorney, they're going to send you a, what's called a litigation hold memo. So you need to keep your information and documentation. Don't destroy anything um, because that can reflect badly on you and, and it can, can ultimately end up with sanctions against you if you get into a lawsuit. Okay. Um, 
You know, the attorney may recommend responding in writing to the communication, identifying why, um, or you can get a, prepare an opinion letter. A lot of companies now will, even though opinion letters are no longer needed for uh, a defense against willfulness, a lot of companies still will use that and still require that to satisfy at least internally and, for example, stockholders or uh, other their business or their board management that they have done everything that they needed to to make sure that they had a good faith basis for proceeding forward, either that the patent's invalid or that it's not infringed. Okay? Um, and it, as part of this, too. You may have occasions where you get somebody sends you a letter and says, hey, we think you're infringing. But you also may have these situations where it's it's not a overly contentious relationship with the other company. And this may be where your cross licensing or your ability to you know, use your own IP to negotiate a settlement comes in. And it's always better, quite honestly, if you know, while well, you need to talk to an attorney and kind of get some counsel and guidance from them. It's always better if you can try to resolve it without having to go to court and without having to get the attorneys too deeply involved and have them fight it out uh, and argue over even the most minute points. Okay. Um, just And lastly, if you get in front, you know, accused of infringement. There are options other than the courts. Um, Patent Office has ex parte reexamination, post grant reviews, inter parties review. Trademark office has cancellation proceedings where you can go in and try to cancel somebody's mark and say, well, their registration is not valid. Uh, and then lastly, mediation or arbitration. You know, the down, downside to mediation is they're going to split the baby uh, and it may not be you know, something you want or the other side wants, but it's an effort to try to resolve uh, the litigation or the, the dispute without having to go far into litigation. Arbitration is a little bit more one sided uh, and has some other issues that can be involved with that. But you need to be aware a lot of contracts now will have mediation or arbitration clauses as a at least a first step. And arbitration, of course, can be binding or non binding. Um, if it's binding, then you may be stuck with whatever the arbitrator's decision is. If it's non binding, at least you can argue around it or you don't have to accept it. Okay? And that's the end of my presentation. So if uh, anybody has any additional questions, happy to answer now. All right. Let's see, guys. Get those fingers loosened up. Type away if you have anything else for them. I will say we did, uh, I think, get a lot of real good interaction during the course of the presentation. So they may be worn out at this point. Okay. Give them just another minute or so, and then uh, we'll let you go. By the way, while we're waiting on that, I, I was kind of chuckling to myself when you were talking about the NDAs and watching some of those. Um, when I worked for, well, I, I, maybe I shouldn't mention who it was, but one of my former employers... Um, it's the one that I told you about uh, before we got on, Scott, that I was involved with uh, uh, some litigation on. And uh, their NDAs were massively one-sided. Even the mutual NDAs were unbelievable. I mean, they're like 12 pages long. And I remember reading one before I sent it off. And it was it was just it's like, why would anybody sign that? But we were the 400-pound gorilla, so they had no choice. Yeah. Uh, and that's that's still the way it can sometimes be. Yep. So. All right. Well, I'm seeing thank yous and great presentation comments and that sort of thing coming in, but no more questions specifically. So I think uh, with that, we will call it an evening. Thank you, everybody, very much for attending. Um, and remember, tell your friends about this. Uh, it will be available online just a few minutes after we sign off. And if you haven't already subscribed and hit that notification icon on YouTube, YouTube, please go ahead and do so. You will be sure to get notified ahead of time that way, or at least as, as much as YouTube's algorithms will.